Oh, oh man. man. Oh, boss, Drago. The card stand, Shalosh. Shabbat Shalom. Happy Fourth of July. We did a parade. I wondered why my legs hurt when I was out there dancing. It's one of the, that was our 34th year in a row to be in the Fourth of July parade. Remember when they canceled it because of COVID, we did our own parade. It cost us like three thousand dollars for all the permits and the barricades and everything. And we had about three churches, and we went around Lincoln Park downtown about four times, and, and uh, had some speakers there and all. But but yes, yeah, so we are a, uh, uh, a traditional part of the trip parade here in Greeley on the 4th and also in, in uh, Windsor on Labor Day. These are two uh, big ones and then they, the dancers do the Cheyenne and Brighton and Longmont and other places too. But, but these are the two big ones. So we had a, a great response from the audience and there was no trouble. I was actually more concerned about the parade than I was about being in Israel uh, <laughs> because I didn't know if, if we might have some um, interference and then and see the twin does the, the he's in the front of our unit and and since he is uh, not passive I always have to be concerned if <laughs> someone engages him he will engage back as he gave us a little talk though before the parade don't engage anybody so you know what he what he did that is so he can do all that <laughs> So this one person, I, get, I never heard it, but he said one person yelled the three Palestine. Mike said, Israel still lives. And then they said, free Palestine. And Mike says, Israel still lives, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> See, never engage. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so and we, we had a great response from everybody. As usual, we're a crowd pleaser. Uh, uh, because we're uh, we're not boring uh, like most of the units. I mean, how many times do you need to see a street sweeper go by? Uh, and, then, and then there's a, a, a semi that's a, a, a trash haul in the semi. You know, and I, do we really need to go to a parade to see one of those? <laughs> they come to our house every week. Right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, me and Mike were watching the parade 35 years ago. And we said, this is the boringest thing created by man. <laughs> and we need to change it. And so it's ever since then, we've been going crazy on the streets of, of uh, Windsor and Greeley. And, uh, and everybody likes it. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, anyway, tomorrow there's this Are You Ready thing. Uh, one of our friends is church over here on 47th Avenue. At, at 12 30 to 3 they got a taco truck there and music and stuff if you want to go by there um, <clears throat> okay so uh what else is going on uh, the whole world is it's still holding together uh, the birds are still singing and I, my flowers are still growing so is there anybody that's concerned with anything no good all right, that closes everything up for the day. Let's have the Shema HaTikva and the Shofars, and then it, there may be another Israel testimony. If, if we can do a quick one, if someone still has one, we've been doing them now for a month. Uh, and so, but I, I went and shared the um, uh, prophetic part of the kid with, on the, um, with the crutches from Yerushalayim. Uh, last week I shared that the music, the, the sound was messed up on our uh, uh, Facebook thing for some reason. And today I'm hoarse from the parade and it's still messed up. <laughs> At least I look good though, don't I? <laughs> More amen than I thought it was. <laughs> uh, but uh, I shared that, uh, they made me share it at, at Joslin, Joslin's church. Uh, last Sunday, and, and it uh, really went over well, and so I may uh, continue to share that if I get invited to different places. But uh, the Shema, who has a testimony? Is there one left? 
from the Israel trip. Nick got his hand up and Mona too. Goodness gracious. And then, oh, and then there's one there. I never get to talk around here anymore. So Nick, come up. You, I saw you first. How many trips you been over on? Seven, I think. Seven. You're a veteran now. Yeah, he's applied for his tour guide license. <laughs> oh, this is this is on. Uh, one time I go, win the parade. I really, was, I was in the parade. I really was watching. But when I got to the spot where she was at, I go over there and I kneel down for her and ask her to marry me. And the crowd just cheered. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been married for fifty some years. <laughs> well, it's this uh, part of my testimony is really hard. Don't get emotional about it. Um, the start of our trip was pretty, pretty crazy. You know, we our plane tickets got canceled, and we had to get another one. It was a long flight, and our lead luggage got lost. We had to wear the same clothes. For three days. Oh. Guys can do that, girls can't. Uh, <laughs> we see this our kind, our kind of rough. So we had the opportunity uh, to go down south into the war zone. And um, what happened there, I guess, is just uh, impacted me more than any other thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, but, the first place we went, we went to an orchard, uh, a grapefruit orchard, and, and uh, helped knock the grapefruits off the trees because they didn't have anybody to pick them because of the war. And uh, so they just knock them off of the trees so the trees don't get so bad. And so they just rot on the ground. Um, but we were there, and, and they told us ahead of time, they said, if you hear the sirens go off, hit the ground and cover the back of your head with your hands. And I really tell them, well, I got bad news. I'm really slow going down. And just, just, just pull on your tush and roll over. <laughs> uh, so, we're, so we're picking, knocking these grapefruit down, and boom! This big old boom, it scared the heck out of me. But it turned out it was our guys. <laughs> our guys. Yeah, so. We were like a mile and a half from the, from the border. <laughs> and, uh, and then we went to one of the settlements that got. Uh, really really hard and we got to meet this one guy that uh we saw a lot of houses that were just destroyed and, and uh it's sort of a lot of different stories but one guy that survived that whole mess him and his um, wife and his three grandsons were locked in the safe room and they burned the house down around them but they survived they were in there for 11 hours but so we we got it at this four hours in and he's told us all the different stories and different things that happened in different days. And uh, I don't know, it's hard to tell what you know and, and everything, but it's it just uh, it was just yeah, you hurt with those people, you know, it's the reverse that says rejoice with those that rejoice and mourn with those that mourn. The other part of the guys who were in Jerusalem that, for Jerusalem Day, they were doing the rejoicing part. Uh, we got stuck with the morning part. Uh, and it just was just a super hard thing to see. And you know, you when you you couldn't take us in the other house, they could take us into his house. And you're walking on on the what used to be the shingles, and they're just crunching under your feet. And you we walk into his house, and then everything burns inside. The stairway's all gone, and, and the roof's gone. Half of the roof's gone. And, I look over in the corner, there's a piano that's not even touched. It's just laying over inside, but it didn't even get touched. And it just it seems so hard to take. So, and then we went down to the Nova, and uh, they walked us around and told us the story. But uh, it's, it's still hard. It's just hard thinking about all those things. But that was, uh, like I said, it was the most impactful thing I've ever experienced. And then we come home, and you know, when you go in this house and you show you, you look up and there's no roof, 
But then you come home and you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you see is your roof, and you thank God for it. But you remember the people that they don't have a roof, they don't even have a home. And then on my drive to church, I love to look at the houses and I see these beautiful homes. And I remember their homes were all bombed up and all messed up and it just it hurts so bad that you can't believe it. But God is still in control. He is. And he loves these people. They're his people. Thank you for sharing that. So I hope mine will um mine is a little different. Um I think of your old ones. There's a rejoicing, but I can't say necessarily that's what my heart was doing the whole time. So um, on this particular trip, um, I was blessed to return to the land after five years of not being there. And I went with two of my children this time. And that alone was very special to see them at an older age and being able to reconnect with God and the land. So that was very special for me. Um, before leaving, I was really most concerned about the people that I know there, their communities, um, the so many places we've been before and the people that we know. So I was in a curious state about, well, what was Jerusalem going to be like? Was it going to be peaceful? Was it going to be um, fearful? Were the stores open? Were they closed? Um, how was the well-being of so many of those that we care about? Um, so two words that have continually replayed in my thoughts. Um, after returning, and even when I was there, what is hope and joy? Is real. I mean, the hope and joy, milk and honey, but also so much more. So I'll just try and sum this up in a few places. So we saw um, these two things, hope and joy, everywhere we went to a certain level. I mean, it's a wartime. Uh, however, um, they were brilliant people. So one was Jerusalem Day, the day of the great, uh, amazing day where the parade and the celebration and ending up at the Western Wall, dancing and concert, and it's just a wonderful time of the young people, mostly high schoolers, gathering together to remember when they were able to take Jerusalem in 1967, and what an accomplishment, because only God could do that in 1967 when you understand that war. Um, and so, just seeing this incredible younger generation and their celebration, and being so close, like, if the dice swung their head, you know, their sweat would, you know, make it over to mine. Um, or, <laughs> or to be so close that as they're dancing in their circle, you can see every expression on every one as they turn. Um, and to see this, the younger generation filled with hope and unity, the expression of life, was um, and it wasn't just the young men, it was the girls in their section too, um, dancing and chanting and just being together. It was such a contrast to the youth in our country. Uh, I had to see drinking, drugs, spell language, no phone, cell phone attachments, um, hair covering their faces and isolation, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, these people exuded life and unity in a way that um, and during a wartime of celebrating a war that they didn't live through, but are currently in a war with their generation. Um, so as we were traveling down this parade route with them, they were very close, um, especially it was kind of like a funnel. 
So the course she got to the end of the funnel, of course we got to everyone. And um, we all shared nice sweaty arms together. Um, and you could look in their eyes, you could hear their laughter, you could listen to their voices, uh, there was energy, and that energy was a hope and joy. In the times of uh, the young women who grabbed our hands when we got out of the funnel into the Western Wall hotel area, and they just were panting. Can we just grab your hand? We bite you in. There you go, and around and around and around. Uh, yeah, so Jerusalem Day was an incredible experience. And the one that I continue to ponder, and when I feel a bit downhearted or concerned, my thoughts take me there. The second event was what we would call probably military graduation. We were in the midst of these Israeli, Israeli families who were with their sons uh, and wearing their green, and they were having dinner. And then we watched them gather together as after a meal. Um, this is all also at the hotel. And so these young men were talking with their families, and they were starting to gather with their units. And then as the units gathered, they would receive information from their commanders or their unit supervisors, you can use them as a military job or not, to explain these people, but basically they were receiving encouragement as a unit. And then the whole unit would jo go join um, into the area where they would receive their weapons and um, be uh, in as part of their brigade. And so, watching this whole experience, as a young, as a mom of um, children close to the ages of the mostly men, there are only a few women because and then we knew that we were definitely dealing with um, soldiers who were being trained for the warfare in Gaza or wherever else that takes them. And once again, there was hope and joy. We saw families praying over their sons. We saw them laughing and um, being together and then watching them walk away um, to join the brigade. So for me, under looking at the current events and a mom, it was a very emotional experience uh, and one that I treasure as I continue to pray for these men and uh, their families. So I also really enjoy listening to our Israeli friends, uh, Moshe, Simka, Israel, Ari and Yehuda, these are people who love and support, and they gratefully, um, well, they were grateful to see us, and we were grateful to see them, and they're just sharing their wisdom, their daily life experiences during the season, their perspectives, and their insights of God. The land, these people are the reason that we go in this special land. We love them all. So I value um, their speeches and I got to record it and continue to play them to remember their hearts. So some other special times for me personally was serving an Ethiopian woman from food from the grocery store that we were able to go shop for. Hearing a restaurant owner express her heartfelt gratitude when we ate in her restaurant. Packing up big bags for those in need for the old and the young because life still goes on. Um, Walking up Jaffa Street, morning and night, sometimes in between, with the hill, with the hill, um, and acknowledging the absence of the young men and the culture. So few tourists were there that we could actually really see the Israelis in their everyday life and their reactions. And enjoy taking part, taking pictures of parts of Jerusalem that Marty took us to because I've never been there. I mean, of certain parts of Jerusalem. Singing in the St. Anne's Chapel, even experiencing the acoustics, phenomenal. Temple Mount was especially meaning, especially meaningful, especially meaningful to me. It always is because it's a place where God put His name, and it always is differently than when I arrive. So I don't want to leave out the daily walking, walking, my walking, shopping in between there. There's certain people who really love to shop. Traveling with the team, you know, when you travel with people, you always get to know them a whole lot more. You know when they're tired, hungry, emotional, 
really all got to know each other. <laughs> I got to watch people, I, watched, I got to watch my son eat various kinds of food, and then people who bought him food. He ate a lot. And then watching Lorna and Joel joke around in every situation, in every site, we didn't know who was the instigator of failure. <laughs> So memories that fill my heart with hope and joy uh, continue when I don't think what I saw. So lastly, I just want to thank all of you who supported with a promise trip who prayed for us um, and other ways that you supported everyone. You are truly a blessed people. So thank you. Yeah, that boy, I watched him eat. I watched him eat the whole time we rode it. <laughs> <laughs> never, never quit. I turned around one time, he's in my pack. It must <laughs> That's one thing we do in Jerusalem is we eat, we eat good. Oh boy, they have good food in Jerusalem. Oh man. Okay, we have enough time to do one parable, and we'll continue to do testimonies uh, next week. We can do Israel testimonies until we go to Israel again. Be all right with me. But yeah. It's a special time, a special place, and a special blessing for us to get to be participating in it. I will be, uh, I am working on a Beast Basics uh, eschatology uh, messages, a couple that we may insert into the parables here as we go along, because it seems to be relevant uh, more and more uh, now with Hezbollah and Iran. But uh, let's do Matthew 13, 24. This is the last one about the farmer who sows, about sowing seeds. Uh, the first parable, remember, was the parable of the sower, and the sower was God, Messiah, Yeshua, Hashem, and, and he was the one sowing, and it will be the same way now we have the parable of the weeds or the parable of the tares, as it's called. If you're a farmer around here, you know that tares is the, the part you throw away. Uh, when you, we haul beets, and as kids, the tops of the beets would be cut off, and then they roll them through this machine, and, uh, and uh, stuff that wasn't the beet would come out at the bottom and so they would weigh the beets and then they would weigh the tares and subtract the tear weight from your beets and because it was to be thrown away it was worthless <clears throat> so in matthew 13 24 there this one is one of the tares that's explained later just like the parable of the sower remember then he explained it to the uh, disciples after the day got later and they went home and this one will be the same way too. Yeshua presented another mashal to them saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to something. And there's always the kingdom of heaven is like something. And so he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is the church, the church age, until the Davidic kingdom comes. And, and so the kingdom of heaven may be like or compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Now, everybody in Israel listening to this parable would say, okay, the kingdom of heaven is like what we see and do every, every year. Uh, we all plant seeds. All farmers plant seeds, okay? So it's, they always, you always use a parable that people can relate to with a similar situation. This way, you can put yourself, you put the audience right into the story. Everybody knows about planting good seeds in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. 
And so when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed? And, and uh, how then does it have wheat and tares? And, and, and the landowner, which is Messiah himself here, he said to them, an enemy has done this. So in this parable, we'll see that there is the kingdom of heaven that God is creating now, uh, which has now lasted 1,995 years. But there is also an enemy to the kingdom of heaven. Okay. And the slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up, pull the weeds? And of course, you know, when, when your plants come up together, if you pull the weeds, it'll pull up the good stuff too. So that's out. Um, he said, no. For while you are gathering the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. So allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, pull the weeds, bind them in bundles, and burn them in the fire. Uh, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so this is uh, something that everybody's familiar with. We all have fields. We all have weeds. And, and so it's very simple, but he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. So, so then he did the parable of, of the leaven, uh, which we'll do next week. Uh, but down in verse 36, he explains the parable. And, and uh, so that's, that's what we have here. Um, <clears throat> so, so it will be, uh, the sower sets up the rest of the parables. The first parable, remember, was the primary that sets up all the rest. And so then this one is like it. Uh, but this one covers the entire church age, including the harvest at the end of the age. So Yeshua told this um, 2,000 years ago, and we're about to experience the part that was he concluded the parable with. 2,000 years have gone by, and we're living in this parable, but we're not living in the planting part as much as we are living in the harvest part because that's what's about to take place on this world. But the kingdom of heaven is like something, and it's like a man who sows good seed. And so we've got to love that part, uh, because, because you are the good seed, right? He sowed people, and, and you are part of that people. You are down the line a little bit from the disciples, but you're still the disciple. So remember, in the sower, uh, it was about four kinds of people, that hear the gospel, and it was about four kinds of hearts that, that hear the gospel and their response to it. Now, this one is about two different kinds of plants that grow after he sows. And you have the good plants, and you have the bad plants, the weeds. So, and, and it says, he came at night and sowed weeds. Now, now, this would be a really mean thing to do to a farmer, right? If he's planted good seeds, and then you go and steal his tractor at night, and, and you pour in weed seed, and then you go and sow right over the top of his good seed. I mean, it, that would, if the farmer caught somebody doing that, that, that guy would not see the sunlight. Okay, you, you get my drift. It's a very bad thing to do to somebody and ruin his livelihood and, and, and also. So, but it says at night because the devil always works in the darkness, right? And, and uh, while the farmer's servants are sleeping. So his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. And, and so when this came up, you can tell wheat because it'll start to grow heads of grain pretty early in its life. And then you wait for it to get mature. And then the, you have the golden waves of grain that are talked about in our country. And, but, but then the tares become evident also and how do you know the difference between a tear and the grain, the good wheat, is the, the tear does not grow any seed, no, no fruit. It is fruitless. It is worthless. And, and so the servants, they ask the question, we can go pull the weeds and uh, you'll get some of those good guys that I sowed. <laughs> so this is all setting you up for the separation that will come. So Yeshua is teaching that this kingdom of heaven is going to have both kinds of plants you know, growing together, but there's going to be a separation. And that separation is the, uh, at the harvest time. 
and not and tell them. So so he answered, an enemy has done this. And and, and uh, so that's that's the uh, part we'll hear explain here. He'll just tell you uh, that that it is the devil. But in verse 30, it says, at the harvest, there will be the separation. And until then, they will all be on the earth together, right? And, and uh, But it says there, there that the um, angels are the ones that will do the separation. So the tares here refer to a weed called, in, in the Middle East, it's called darnel. Anybody heard of darnel? It is wheat without seed. It looks the same. You cannot tell it from the good wheat, except that it doesn't grow a head on it. There's no fruit. And so this is actually has a name in the Middle East, and it's Darnell. So everybody says that he's talking about Darnell, and they would all have known Darnell. It looks like wheat, but never grows uh, the grain. And, and so it's worthless, a worthless wheat. So now Yeshua will explain, uh, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came and said, Explain to us the parable of the terrors of the field. So this is probably like either just one or two days after the rejection of the kingdom in Matthew 12. And, and so we're still right in the early stages of Yeshua's ministry changing. There was the big change in the ministry after Beelzebub. And then from there on, he only taught in parables. And this was also remembered to separate people, the ones whose hearts were hard and bad and would not respond, would not mess up the program that he's now instilling into the disciples, which is the kingdom of heaven. So the, everybody whose hearts were good and soft and able to receive would come and hear the parables and understand them. But we're right at the very beginning of, of this change in his ministry. And, and so, uh, so he has to explain a couple of these to the disciples. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Bar Anasha, we know, is the son of man, which is Yeshua's title for himself as God. And, and it is the son of man title is the title from Daniel, which means that he is God. And so this is why he continued, continually used it for himself. He used the Mashiach word a couple of times, but son of man like 50 times. And, and so he, he, he is the son of man uh, from Genesis 3.15. Uh, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And the field now is the world. So, so uh, this, sit, this farmer that's sowing this seed is sowing the world. And so you live on the world, you are in a field that has good good seed growing in it, and you are in the world that has bad seed growing in it. And you don't get to be separate. You are together. Anybody ever seen somebody who's not good seed in your life? Anybody? <laughs> right? And, and, uh, and the field is the world, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. So you have the Son of Man, which is God, and you have his followers, with our, which are the sons of the kingdom. And uh, for you ladies, you are sons of the kingdom. <laughs> and, and the enemy, though, now who sowed them, remember in the first part he says, an enemy has done this. Who is this enemy that would do such a thing? The enemy who sowed them is the Devil. So here, right away, we see we have God and we have the devil. God is sowing, the devil is sowing in the same field. This is going to be a situation, right? And the harvest is at the end of the age. So then we see that, the, that there's not going to be the separation until the uh, time is over. And the reapers are the angels. And so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all the stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness, depending on your translation, will be those who commit iniquity. It's just the bad people. Okay, 
Uh, but the stumbling block one is interesting there in the NASB, if you read that way, uh, the ones that put up stumbling stones in front of good people. So they're not just growing next to a good weed, but they're trying to, to uh, knock off the good weed. So, so you can see the intensity here. And those who commit lawlessness, so that's just iniquity, which is the, the bad kind of sin. And, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. And that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so he who has an ear, let him hear. And so we have an ear and we hear. Oh, man. Uh, the ones who sow the good seed, though, is God. And, and so this, this is a, a, a majestic, majestic parable here because it's talking about you. Uh, Messiah sows his people into the world. It started with the 12, the 11 disciples, and then, and then it goes forward. And, and when we see the, the parable of 11 next week, it'll be fun to see, see that work. It's, it's similar to the mustard seed, right? Uh, but they're like fruitful, good wheat, uh, the ones that the Son of Man sows. And now the tares... Uh, are, are also sons, but they're sons of the devil, the evil one. And so this church age, therefore, is like the wheat growing all over the world. So the whole world is a wheat field, amen, which if you go up north here on Highway 85, it'll look like that there. Uh, all you can see is wheat field. And it's like the whole world is a wheat field. <laughs> if you've ever been up north, okay. The only other thing up there is antelope. And a, and a water tower that says, watch none grow. <laughs> and, and somebody painted weeds on it. Watch none grow weeds. <laughs> and that's about all I've ever had to know. <clears throat> I used to run around with some young people. They were called the nun bones. Okay. Um, uh, but anyway, the church age. It's like wheat growing, and, and there's the good and the bad growing together. In the, in the, so these, these sons of the devil have been growing and reproducing for 2,000 years, and the sons of the kingdom have been growing and reproducing for 2,000 years. And finally now, we're about to come to the time in history where there will be the separation finally. Amen. And, and there will be a great day in the harvest. But uh, um, uh, what what we should we? Um, I wanted to say that uh, oh, about the stumbling blocks and those who commit sin are thrown into the fire. So this this really is is the sons of the kingdom are the ones preaching the gospel and and, and taking care of the kingdom of heaven, which is the church age. You don't have to be an evangelist. But if you're in the church, and if you've ever cleaned the church restrooms, you are advancing the kingdom of heaven, okay? Anything you do for the church, with the church, uh, offering or, or ministry or, or in the grocery store, if, if you're wearing a Christian t-shirt, you are advancing the kingdom of heaven on earth. You are the good seed, right? And, and, and so it, uh, praise the Lord for that. But then there is the other ones, and, and, and the other ones will throw, be thrown into the fire. And here it says, a uh, fiery furnace, the, the, uh, place, the furnace of fire or the fiery furnace. So this, most likely, you've got to look at it, is Rev 20, where, where the, those that, whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life are thrown into uh, the lake of fire, uh, burning with brimstone. Right until the end, uh, until the age of the ages, and and so that is the fiery furnace, and and we have a description of this lake of fire. It says weeping and gnashing of teeth. Isn't that right? Then there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you know this term. It's a Jewish idiom, and and uh, it's not the one you want to be involved with. Uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth is a very negative Jewish idiom. And, and uh, uh, then, then at the end of the age, we have the wonderful description of the sons of the kingdom. They will shine like the sun, shining in the kingdom of their father. So here now, once again, 
the Son of Man is the Father. Okay? It's, you can't separate it. And here the Sower and Messiah are both called the Father God. And so we have the Son of Man in his divinity displayed here. So it's a great parable about, about this uh, Oh, and, and the shining like the sun, what would that remind his readers or his listeners of uh, as they're listening to the parable the first time it was told? It would remind them of Daniel 12, 3, talking about the end of the age. Daniel, at the last chapter of his prophetic word, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead and, and those who lead the many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So th this is a eschatological statement here about the believers in the last days will be shining. And so at the harvest, all the believers since since the beginning of this two thousand year period will be shining like the stars or shining like the sun. And and that is a description of them. But the others are in this lake of fire, and the description of the lake of fire is weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Now, you know you grind your teeth sometimes if you're really upset, uh, and, and uh, it, it's not good. Okay, now this idiom, though, is found several times in the Bible, and it means terrible remorse, uh, shame, regret. And it does not actually refer to physical pain. Uh, it's more of a heart matter, and it refers to dang it. Dang. I was so stupid. Oh. And I always think about uh, people uh, when you do prison ministry, and you go in there, and there's this humble little. 80 year old guy, just the sweetest little thing, you know. And what in the world are you doing this with? And, and he, he's been there since he was 19. He doesn't even remember who he was when he killed that person. Can't even remember. But he's still there. That is weeping and gnashing. Why was I so stupid in a moment, mm -hmm. 60 years, 70 years in prison? And the prisons are full of people like that. But here, this uh, term, I would say, does not really represent physical pain. And I'll show you why. In Acts 7, 54, the apostate leadership of Israel heard Stephen's message, right? Remember <coughs> Stephen proclaimed his message? And it says in Acts there that those, those evil Jews there, the uh, ones that were against uh, Yeshua, they gnashed their teeth at Stephen when he told them the truth. That is not physical pain, that is an emotion. They were angry, so angry that they gnashed their teeth and then they killed it. So, so gnashing of teeth is, is more of an emotion. So here, in the, the, to be gathered up and to put into fire is a, is a regret, a remorse, a, a dang it time. Believe I was so stupid. And this is the saddest part of rejecting the gospel is when this separation comes, there's going to be all this weeping and gnashing of teeth, and, and, and they're going to be so sorry. And it's not going to be a time for, for the righteous to gloat over this or get revenge, ha ha ha, or anything. No, uh, it will we'll be tempted to weep with them because God loves all of them. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's a very sad thing. But why, why does it happen? Because there is the devil. And 
And so man has the choice, always the choice. Which one will you follow? You always got to be owned by somebody. And you either get owned by the devil or you get owned by God. So that's the emotion here. It's 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 a, a, a great remorse. And Yeshua says, "Do not be deceived." Uh, Darnell looks good, like wheat, but it's not wheat. And so I just that's the end of the parable and the end of teaching on that. We know what it means. Uh, but but the Darnell in in our day, I'm concerned with with another aspect of the Darnell is you can't tell it from real wheat, except it doesn't bear fruit. So now, in the church, is there some Darnell growing? It has the word darn. <laughs> and, and you know, the thing of the last days is, do not be deceived. Matthew 24, the first thing he says about the last days, do not be deceived. So there may be in the church today, Darnell, that will be a stumbling stone. Where it says, cause a stumbling here. That they will stumble people from the real gospel, the real truth, the, the uh, real word of God. And this concerns me in these days, because we're already... Have, have something of like that going on in the worldwide church with, with some of the craziness that people are teaching now and, and getting away from the pure word of God. And so, so uh, he says, do not be deceived. Darnell looks good. It looks like the real thing. But how do you tell that it's not? By their fruit. It has no fruit. And so this is one of the things that we can watch for. Uh, in in uh, ministries and teachings and uh, false prophets that may be popping up around around us in these days. Uh, it looks like wheat, but it's from the devil. So in these days, it seems like the righteousness uh, and the evil are, are out in the open and they're easily discerned in these days, like in our government. You know, it, It's like there's the left and the right, and the right is on the Bible side, the left ain't. And so it's easily to discern. You're the left, you're blooming a weed. If you're on the right, you got some fruit. But but then there's also though this this uh, matter that that Yeshua warned us that that it, towards the end it's not going to be all that simple, not all that out in the open. So there must be a deception coming that we all have to be aware of and be careful. That, that we stay in the word of God with a, with a good hermeneutic and, and not let ourselves be uh, misled by Darnell, the, the stuff that looks good, but it ain't. And, and so be careful and, and uh, 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 we'll stick with the Bible and, and be strong in the Lord and to be strong in the Holy Spirit. And this is uh, how I will uh, terminate this message on on uh, saying uh, that that great separation is coming, but you do not have to worry about which one you're in, because all of you are bearing fruit. You are all having you you like you're leaning over a little bit because the fruit is so heavy that I mean, the stalk is just hanging on because. You're bearing so much fruit. Thank you very much. Y'all Varekika, Adonai, Yudish Mareka, Yair Adonai, Panava Leka, Vipu Naka, Yisa Adonai, Panava Leka, Ba Yosayim Naka, Shalom, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sarah Shalom, Amen, and Amen. The Lord bless you and give you and make His face to shine upon you and, and be, be, oh, make your face shine. Make your face shine, like you be shine like the brightness of the sun, oh man. And, and lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Messiah. Oh man and oh man, the great farmer. Oh man, and he's going to get a harvest. Are you ready for that day of the harvest to come? How glorious that will be. And then you get your reward too, amen. So hang on. Be strong in the Lord and Shabbat Shalom. Amen.